are going to try and cover a lot of ground um, today uh, regarding um, what we're seeing in sustainability with regard to specifications and in the industry. Um, please feel free to ask, ask questions. So the, um, the issue here is um, nature's got two billion years of experience running the planet. Um, and nature takes care of itself a, as it will. Um, I think our real goal is to take care of uh, um, our cities. Um, there's a quote here that shows uh, from a book recently, five million people move to the cities every month. So as architects and as designers, as specification writers, this is what we have to make work. We have to share water. Uh, we have to share transportation. We have to share energy. Uh, we have to work together as a community, so we shouldn't lose sight as to what sustainability is about. Um, there's always a chance that we'll get it wrong. Many of you have seen this slide of the building in China that fell over so slowly that the windows didn't break. Um, someone omitted the uh, steel in the, uh, in the pilings, and then there was excavation next to the building. Um, uh, quite a, a terrifying sight. Um, there are no spec police out there, as we've all found. Uh, we, we have to get it right. Um, sustainability is a point of view. Perhaps you've seen this slide before. Uh, if you live uh, below the dam um, and the water is controlled by the dam, um, you're very thankful that it's there. Uh, this, when this loose gate opens, the water is controlled. Again, you're safe. If you're in a kayak, if you're in a canoe, um, if, if you're a fish, this is certainly a, a, a nightmare. Um, sustainability happens at the big picture. It's at, um, in Alexandria this week with CSI's technical committee. Um, when I went into my hotel room, there were eight lights on, and I, I couldn't figure out why. Uh, when another member went into his room, there were no lights on, and he tripped over the sofa. So um, I guess uh, you can't win for trying, but I think we all have to try. And as I've said a lot of times before, um, it's really um, about going green to greener. This is a slide from Autodesk and Phil Bernstein that, that shows the, the total cycle of information modeling. Um, perhaps you're in programming, perhaps you're in conceptual design, perhaps you're in, in detailed design. Uh, we all live on this, on this circle somewhere. Certainly we need to pay attention to uh, what documents are, are coming next. Now, um, you've probably been green formatted to death. Um, and if you've been to the website, perhaps you've been concerned that um, you know there aren't 10,000 projects on there. But, but I urge you to uh, meet green format the PDF. Um, download it for free from the CSI website, from the green format website. Um, there are five chapters in, uh, in green format. It's an absolute essential guide for your own office to understand the range of sustainable options that are, that are out there. It's a five-part document. Part one is uh, background information and what green format is about. Part two is product details. Goes through sustainable standards and certifications, third-party certifications, second-party certifications, self-declaration, performance criteria, uh, sustainable composition of products. Part three has to do with the product life cycle, uh, material extraction, manufacturing, construction. Um, there's a, a section on the stewardship and, and who's providing the information if you're a manufacturer. And then uh, there's a, um, a glossary of terms, reference standards. So, so um, you really should have that document again. It's for free on the, on the website. CSI has also uh, established a, a green format ma maintenance task team to make sure that it's up to date and matches uh, industry standards and current events. Paul Sternberg is the chair. Um, the group has been together for an, a few years. It's, um, they're amazing, and they're, they're very well qualified to be keeping um, it up to date. Um, next, CSI and sustainability. Many of you know that Paul Bertram is now president of CSI. Um, he's also with uh, Kingspan uh, Insulated Panels. Um, he's one of the uh, founders of Green Format. Uh, he's done a lot with life cycle analysis, a lot with property sets and sustainability. 
Um, so Paul is um, a leader and a believer, and it's, it's sustainability and CSI are going to go together very well this year. Um, there is this sustainability practice group, so here we are. Um, thank you for tuning in. Remember, those previous sessions are still on the web. Um, if you have that uh, spare hour to uh, to listen, the one that Richard Moore did on um, flooring and the new lead requirements and floor score was excellent. Uh, Richard also uh, did a session on uh, Ford Stewardship Council wood rules and the pure and mixed and all the new pieces. Last month it was on, on porous paving. So. Okay, so the USGBC is out there, and they've got 70 chapters and 16,000 firms that are members, 168,000 certified professionals, and uh, now instead of just LEAD or LEAD AP, we see BD and C showing up after people's names, which is, of course, um, LEAD's uh, continuing education requirement. Um, from my own point of view, I've signed up for LEAD AP, BD, and C, which means I've got to do 15 years of continuing ed. A, a year, but I seem to do a tremendous amount of that, so I, I don't think it'll be a burden to me. Uh, they're never going to take your LEAD AP away, and the only time you're going to absolutely need the LEAD AP, B, D, and C is if you're the person who is the LEAD certified professional for that project, so there will come a time when when you will need that. If um, if um, you, you don't expect to be the person who's the designated um, professional, then, then lead AP will work for you. Um, you know, make your make your own decision. Now, lead credits. I just want to. This was in uh, this month's Environmental um, uh, Design and Construction magazine, and just remember there are eight lead programs now, schools, existing buildings, operation and maintenance, new construction, retail new construction, commercial interiors, core and shell, retail commercial interiors, and healthcare. And the credits don't match. And your language and your specs won't match. So you need to start keeping track of, um, of what's going on. Um, just grabbing the, the text um, you know, from, from one lead program to another won't work, especially when it comes to things like uh, regional materials where one group of programs has it as uh, extraction and distance and the other just has it as, as distance. So again, um, I'm going to move along here, but the, um, just as a, uh, a note to be, to be careful. We've got our green rating systems and programs. Um, somebody a few weeks ago said there were maybe 600 of them. Uh, I wish them all success, uh, but in, uh, in my world as a specifier, it tends to be um, LEED that, that's moving, moving forward. Um, the eight programs of LEED, if you do schools, you're probably dealing with the CHIPS language. It's, it's similar, but uh, again, unique, the California 1350 standards. Living Building Challenge, we've, we've done one of those projects. and. Um, there are particular requirements. Estadama, if you're over in Abu Dhabi and, and the Middle East, and the Pearls um, rating system, the Passive House, uh, again, a lot of requirements. Passive House is kind of a pass-fail, but the, uh, you start dealing with um, you know, super-insulated buildings and careful control of, of, of noise. Uh, we're doing an apartment building now, Passive House. And uh, each apartment has to be tested individually. Um, then uh, Green Globe's uh, self-certification system, where um, we don't see it used as much, but uh, certainly these are the projects that we've seen uh, specifications uh, written written around. Now, the green labeled products. Are you going to let other people decide for yourself what your what your products are? Um, there's uh, uh, people like FloorScore and FSC and CRI that uh, uh, seem to have uh, the USGBC's ear. But again, um, we have to decide what's relevant. So what do we, you know, here are um, seven things that um, just came to mind when putting together the, uh, the session today. Um, synthetic drywall and shipping. Now, well, certainly synthetic drywall is a good product. You've got a you can uh, catch it when it uh, precipitates out the stacks of a coal fire power plant. Um, and then you can ship it to your site. 
but uh, recently USG did a life cycle analysis and, and found if the plant uh, that has synthetic drywall and the plant that doesn't have synthetic drywall are different locations, um, don't ship something more than 14 miles to get synthetic drywall or your LCA based on the uh, uh, trucking and, and gas costs will will exceed that. Um, California, a lot of people are prone to uh, specify synthetic drywall. It often has to come from a great distance. So you, you'll have to decide whether you're just trying to meet that uh, lead credit or um, whether you're understanding um, the, the total impact of um, of what you're doing. Another note from USG to grind the drywall to recycle instead of putting it in another truck and taking it to a recycling plant. Um, you can grind it up into pellets. You can use it as a soil amendment on your site. Um, it, uh, it helps uh, with water retainage because the drywall will, uh, um, will liquefy and harden, sort of plaster of Paris and liquefy state and go back and forth again and again. So it actually helps um, to retain water on a site. Another, another item, rebonded carpet cushions and toxins. This month in uh, Environmental Building News, they pointed out that um, although uh, rebonded carpet cushion means that you've got a recycled carpet cushion, that um, no one uh, really tags where that material comes from. And when it's been tested, it actually outgasses more than uh, a virgin urethane pad. Uh, the people who make the pads um, assert that there, it takes less energy to um, to make a, a rubber pad um, than a rebonded um, urethane pad. Um, again, each industry to their own. Cork under layman and acoustics. Um, cork sounds like a, a good sustainable material. Um, we know those trees get harvested once every 20 years. The acoustical engineers on a recent project said that because it really doesn't handle impact noise in a, in a dorm that um, uh, they voted against cork. Um, so again, you can't just pick something because of its um, of, of one property. You have to look at the, the overall, overall task. Um, as an aside, the, the wine industry went to plastic corks. Uh, now if you're uh, Schloss Volrods, you have a glass cork with a little plastic piece on the top that, that, um, that seals supposedly even better. And those metal caps seal even better than corks. But, you know, and then you hear secondhand that the people are cutting down the cork trees because no one wants them for corks. So um, go figure. Uh, spray foam insulation fire hazard. There have been two jobs in Massachusetts where the state fire marshal has uh, pointed out that there's, there have been job site fires because uh, the material at some point gets very hot when it's being sprayed and, and setting up. And uh, they've, they've had uh, construction fires during um, uh, that have uh, been quite dangerous as, as they burn. So um, again, you know, always need a, a qualified installer. As a spec writer, as an architect, uh, I've been told I didn't need to know means and methods, but you know, again, something to figure out. Another item in a large hospital project uh, study was done uh, versus some new rubber flooring versus polishing uh, some vinyl composition tile. And uh, over the course of the year, this hospital saved uh, uh, purportedly $500,000 by not needing their polishing materials and saving labor. Um, you know, they found that they were able to keep the rubber floors clean, which with mild cleaning, uh, it wasn't a problem in the healthcare environment. Uh, and then again, there's another group that believes that the only uh, floor is a is a shiny floor. So um, I believe the uh, data from the from this hospital. So um, that's something to consider. Paper towel dispensers and sustainability. Um, you know, as specifiers, a lot of times we hear that the owner is uh, providing the paper towel dispensers. Um, and uh, I guess what turns out is if you're really looking for the sustainable approach, you, you need a, a generic dispenser because all the ones that, that come from the, the companies that provide the dispensers for free only hold the, uh, the paper towels of their size. So um, 
again, different industries look for, for different advantages and uh, pieces and parts of sustainability. Um, uh, another I call is green churnings one. I was uh, perhaps you saw in Time magazine or the newscast that um, the uh, House of Representatives had voted to uh, uh, you know change the uh, regulations. So the energy efficiency light bulb regulations, which went into effect in 2007, would be reversed, along with uh, most other environmental um, uh, regulations. Um, I, I don't see how they can do that in good conscience. I don't see, you know, whether you believe in global warming or not is up to you. But certainly, we've had we've had climate change, um, and personally, again, I, I can't imagine how six billion people aren't making that happen. Um, so at a meeting last week, the um, it's reported that the EPA is not necessarily seeking lead in its future projects. Um, whether they're moving to lead equivalent or lead um, uh, certifiable, um, I'm not sure. I tried to verify it a little bit earlier today. Um, in uh, in the city of Boston, for example, projects over 50,000 square feet need to meet mass lead plus requirements, need to be certifiable, which means the architect has to turn in the lead scorecard, um, then collect the documentation even if the project isn't uh, being certified um, officially through LEED. Um, it does seem a little counterintuitive to go all that effort and, and then actually not certify. Uh, someone in a, a government agency told me that it was, since USGBC is a private organization, they, they were just having trouble um, uh, forcing developers to use it. They didn't think that that was government's role. Um, Department of Energy has been looking at the zero net energy projects. Um, they are um, backing off on that, although there's a whole um, group of projects on the whole Building Design Guide website. I'll give you that email or that website later. But the, uh, if every building had, was net zero, had its own energy systems, had its own um, controls, um, it just does away with the amount of the resources necessary to do that compared to a, uh, a power plant of whatever power source handling half a million homes. Um, it's, it's just pretty logical to assume that um, a system set up for mass distribution um, uh, is less impact per individual unit. Um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, their Center for Engineering Research Lab, um, there was a meeting last week in Chicago talking about sustainability properties of products, of sustainability products uh, for um, mechanical systems. They have studies going on that are looking for the 20 ways to, to document the, the 20 most energy efficient HVAC systems or how to put um, information into specifications on, um, on sustainability um, pieces and, and parts. So that's a very active group. Uh, Christine Fallon's group was, um, had done uh, a lot of research for the, uh, for the core. And um, I think everybody is marching to the, the same drummer there. Third party certifications um, have come under hit um, from the manufacturers a, a lot lately. Um, the manufacturers have had meetings, maybe even this this week at uh, AIA again last year, because of the amount of money it costs to to do certifications. Um, you know that you get something like uh, VOC content, recycled content. Uh, so many so many agencies uh, looking at this. There was. Um, you know, there is the, the situation where the VOC content, every manufacturer has to have a uh, MSDS sheet, material safety data sheet. And that MSDS sheet has to have a VOC content printed on. And if the manufacturer were to uh, fabricate that, the FTC can, can find them. A couple of years ago, the FTC Federal Trade Commission fined a company $155,000 for claiming they could get uh, an R19 out of about a half an inch. Um, it, it was just uh, the marketing department um, got totally out of out of control. The recycled content and regional materials here on the slide. 
Um, you know, we've, we've done a couple projects, uh, lead projects, where uh, recycled content and regional material credits weren't sought. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is they weren't sought because they didn't want the contractor to collect the paperwork. They felt that there was a cost there. You know, our firm has uh, done specifications under lead projects. We've never had a project that didn't get the recycled content uh, credit or the regional credit. Um, there, there's always a way to get that, often with only five or six materials. Um, finally, in this slide, overstated claims. Um, I'm sure we've all seen, uh, I got uh, someone in the brick industry said their brick earned 26 credits. Uh, someone told me their corner guard um, promoted uh, the lead credit for reuse of buildings. Um, they just didn't seem to understand that that yes, you can get a lead credit for saving 50% of the previous building, uh, but maybe that corner guard would have had to been installed 20 years ago when that building was first built. It doesn't really impact how it is now. Um, and, and of course, the cost of a corner guard to the cost of a building uh, rounds off to zero. So um, the marketing departments are, are just um, out of control on some of these. Green churnings, two, another seven items. Thank you for your patience. Um, we had a case where the um, casework manufacturer limited their warranty when no added urea formaldehyde um, products were used. Um, it turns out that the um, some of the plywood in the casework uh, was turning the veneers black. Uh, it was causing shadows. Um, I've seen some pictures of this. Uh, someone told me that the industry understands this and has has solved this problem, um, but it may happen in your uh, casework specification that you make sure that you're going to get um, your normal warranty um, ahead of the time when they're fabricating it. A big impact on um, uh, insulation. Insulation, of course, is, is one of the primary ways to um, improve your building performance. Um, you know, the amount of energy it, it takes to to produce insulation versus the result is staggering. The um, X XPS, the extruded polystyrene from Dow and Owens Corning and, and uh, others, um, generally considered R5.0 uh, per inch. The polyiso claims have been up around six or seven or eight per inch. Um, there's there's recent testing that that I've seen then that uh, you should really treat them both at 5.0 if you're considering the long-term aged R value of polyiso and extruded polystyrene. Um, mineral wool is in there at 3.4. I think cellulose is in there in the same mix. So so pay attention, you know, to your insulation and and don't believe exaggerated um, standards. When it comes to university standards and sustainability, it, it um, worked with a number of universities lately. Their, their, their faculty, their students, um, their uh, cumulative university score on sustainability that's made available to students as they pick colleges, it's incredibly important to them. So many of them are developing standard division one language for lead and then letting the uh, design teams um, solve the problems or, or, or go for the certification as, as, best, um, as best they can. The people in the universities who are concerned about spending money will say, you know, I want lead silver, not lead gold. Don't spend the extra money. Um, but once the contractor's on board, um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of financial impact from getting from that, that silver um, to gold certification. Division one in LEED, I mentioned before that your Division one general requirements specifications have to take into account which LEED program that you're, you're dealing with. Um, it's, it's very important that you uh, ask for things that are realistic. Division one is where you, you know, you will control um, where your lead scorecard is, you will control, um, if you want, maybe which sections are, are applying to each credit, where you want uh, the contractor to do uh, um, a plan on how to achieve a credit and then how often to main, maintain it. But again, I think uh, common conventional wisdom and specifications 
so that if you want FSC wood, you put it in the wood door section. You can't rely on Division One to that. You can't rely on the fact that the wood door subcontractor will see Division One and understand what's going on. Also, if um, this, including the the stock lead language about 50% recycled. Um, uh, or FSC certified wood to achieve the credit, um, it doesn't make much sense to put 50% requirement in a wood door section. You should you should take a look and decide if you've got architectural woodwork and uh, blocking and wood flooring and wood doors. If, if you knew your wood doors were more than 50% of the value, then take 100% of your doors FSC and 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 if if you leave it out of the other sections. I mean, if your sustainability or goals are there to have FSC in there no matter what, um, that's a different story. But if you're just after the lead credit, then um, then that's what's going on. So the lead ready specs, you know, in our office, we tend to put the green language in green. Um, I wouldn't know how to specify non-green products because the whole marketplace is, has gone to that. But again, the, the spec is collecting the, the paperwork from the contractor, and uh, you need to have um, that information there. When I the next uh, bullet point, when it says BIM ready specs, uh, we're finding that um, in these days of uh, competition, um, you know, fierce competition among manufacturers and contractors that um, we need, um, certainly if you're going to have one product name in the spec, you need to control the attributes. Sustainability is one of those attributes. If you need those wood doors to contribute to the FSC credit, then that's one of the, one of the uh, property sets of, of a wood door. So that information right now can go in the spec. Um, the whole marketplace is starting to, at least the manufacturers, making that available with their, with their BIM objects. Um, it's a, it's still in its infancy, but um, you know both sides of the industry are, are talking with each other. Then finally, green and Omniclass. I, I, the uh, Omniclass, of course, is the 23 tables. Uh, CSI is the um, shepherding organization of Omniclass. Uh, there are properties, there are phases of the project, there are um, attributes, there master format is a table, uniformat is a table, and green is there in, in, in many locations. So thank you for the, that, your patience there for the slow moving slides. Um, Ford Stewardship Council Wood, SFI, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, PEFC, out of, out of Europe. Um, you know, if you're doing a lead project, it's going to be FSC. For a project in the Middle East, the wood was PEFC certified, and and that uh, was fine with the with the Estadama program. Um, um, so they're all fine programs. Again, decide for yourself. If you read the fine print on uh, carpet complying with CRI, I mean, up until recently, I thought that meant it had to have a certification number, and in in fact, uh, lead will even ask you for the number. Um, but it doesn't have to have the CRI certification to uh, comply with the requirements of CRI. Um, you, Lee does not require you to use the Carpet and Rug Institute's certification program, whereas they do require that um, you have a chain of custody for the for the Forest Stewardship Council documents. Floor score is taking over the uh, the flooring industry. Um, recently, some of the tile manufacturers have. Uh, gotten blanket certifications for, for all their tile instead of having to, um, you know, test 3,000 tiles because it's inert and it wasn't going to, um, um, you know, the VOC levels um, weren't there. Now, the, the VOCs and the MSDS sheets, you know, we we're measuring VOCs when something's in the liquid state. It, we're not measuring it. Once that paint goes from the can and it, it's on the wall, we're, we're no longer measuring it. Um, the way it, it can be measured, there are there are still coatings that will will outgas. Again, the MSDS sheets are the are the truth telling pieces and and parts of of, of what's going on in the, in the industry. So um, you know we, we need to to pay attention. And again, you have to pay attention to the um, um, the performance of something. Again, um, anecdotal evidence says that the the VOC, um, zero VOC coatings 
um, are a little bit harder to brush on. They sort of need to spray them as opposed to the, the low VOC coatings, both of which meet lead. And then there is a little bit of um, uh, legal activity in the industry where some of the uh, paint companies were litigating against other paint companies who were claiming for zero VOCs when the primer was zero VOC, but the uh, the color pigment was not. So, um, you know, what's what's a poor spec writer to do? Um, indoor air quality certainly um, an absolute critical critical thing for for our industry. The um, I mentioned in the last slide that the material outgassing, the phase change of, of products is um, is what the indoor air quality um, groups around the, the country are, are looking at. Um, you'll need to pay attention to that. As far as when the building is being built, we know um, we've got that's our chance for entrance mats um, to you know the three sources of indoor air quality pollution. Um, primary ones when you're talking about the building or the what comes in on your shoes with your entrance mats, what comes through the slab on grade, if you're not using a vapor retarder or if you have radon, and then what the cleaning supplies are being used. Once the building is built, I'm told by the in indoor air quality groups that it's the furnishings that start outgassing, um, the perfume, even the uh, the body odor of the occupants when when you're doing air sampling in an existing building, um, the uh, there there may be times when you know people are are sensitive to perfume or or maybe didn't have a chance to take a, a shower that day. Um, indoor air quality is a is a tricky thing. Uh, at a, a school in my hometown here, they were doing asbestos abatement on a school. The uh, asbestos reading in the school was very low. Outside where all the cars pulled up and the brake pads were hit, the, the asbestos reading was higher outside. So um, again, we just have to keep our wits about us as, as we work on, on these different pieces and parts. Uh, free online resources that you should uh, oh. Yes, Matt? Yep, Mark. I'm going to sneak in here. We have a question from Don Harris. Uh, just stating um, regarding to that, uh, in the past, there had been concern about um, regarding architect's review and approval of MSDS sheets. Um, and the product data sheets usually have the VOC content. Is it still an issue? Um, is the VOC content not considered official, quote unquote, unless it is on the MSDS sheet? No, the, uh, well, a couple things there. The, the VOC content is considered official as soon as a company gives it to you. They can give it to you on an MSDS sheet. They can give it through you uh, through a third-party certification. Um, um, they, can, they can give it to you in a letter for a particular project. Um, they can give it to you through Green Seal. Um, I agree that, um, you know, when I served on the Master Spec Review Committee, it was decided uh, at least at that time with that group, that the architect really shouldn't be collecting MSDS sheets because um, it, it contained information that uh, went beyond the architect's knowledge and the questions, you know, why did you allow this chemical on your project? Um, so I don't know of any um, firms that, that collect, architectural firms that collect MSDS sheets. I do know the hospitals that, that we work with insist on it because they have a list of banned chemicals that interact with, uh, you know, with patients who are already uh, a little immune suppressed. I know contractors who require it, uh, but I don't know of any, of, of any architects. Um, um, you know, a comment I got from a manufacturer is, why should I pay one of these third-party certifiers $60,000 when it's already on my MSDS sheet? So, you know, just passing along that comment. And then, Mark, there's also uh, one more, more of a comment, um, really. Um, just noting that um, PESC is based in Switzerland, um, and it's also a third-party um, accreditation for uh, SFI, ATFS, and CSA in North America. Um, and just wanted to let everyone know, I guess, that PEFC certifies um, other forestry um, certification systems, um, and you'll see their name on North American wood products. Um, and then goes on to indicate that currently, as of right now, um, lead projects outside the U.S. accept PEFC. However, um, in the U.S., USGBC currently is the only rating system 
um, that does not accept PEFC wood um, for their projects. All right. Well, thank you for the person who uh, who um, who wrote who wrote that in. Uh, I always learn something every time we do one of these sessions, and uh, I didn't know that. Um, so. Um, thank you, and thank you for making that available to the group and putting it on the recording here. Um, anything else, Matt? Nope, that's it at the moment. It looks like, oh, wait, it, one more question here. Will MSDS be required to submit separately uh, from the technical data shop drawing submittals? The, um, when an architect, if I understand the question correctly, when an architect specifications require a shop drawing submittal, uh, if an MSDS isn't listed as one of the submittals, um, it generally uh, is is not submitted. Most building product manufacturers now have a, a lead sheet where, if they know it's a lead project, they can uh, submit where you know the region for the regional credit or the recycled content or the VOC content uh, as as a matter of course, since so many thousands of projects are seeking lead certification. Um, this page for the free online resources, the whole building design guide, 7 million pages. Um, your government's uh, uh, tax dollars or your tax dollars at, at, at work. Um, you know, they're, they're the Federal Green Guide for Specifiers, the Sample Division I, um, constant updates on what's going on in different agencies. Uh, the high performance buildings um, analyses, the zero, VO, zero net energy buildings, it's, it's all there at wholebuildingdesignguide.com. Um, the uh, five others I put up there are just personal favorites. Um, USGdesignstudio.com has a, a new update where you can get your, your lead sheet automatically. Um, you can pick your ceiling or your, you know, by acoustics or by recycled content or by regional materials. Uh, USG, um, to their credit, has uh, analyzed all of their materials to the ASTM standards and makes all this available for free on their on their website. So not only can you look for a, you know, a 13-foot partition with a three and a half inch uh, deep stud. Uh, SCC of 52, but they'll tell you where they make it and and give you the and give you the breakdown. Um, Rick Master at USG Design Studio said actually one of the primary users of the site are the subcontractors looking to uh, turn in the UL assembly information and then lead assembly information. Uh, BuildingGreen.com always a popular site. Environmental building news, um, not taking advertising. Uh, you need four or five articles on porous paving. It'll be there. There's a free portion of the site, and then there's a, a pay site. RCAT.com, the architect's catalog. Uh, there's 6,000 products that have green sheets on there. There are 900 free specifications. There's uh, free outline specs and short form specs where you can uh, uh, do just do a check and get documents in Word. Um, I'm partial to RCAT because they put our short form spec up there. Um, uh, as the basis of their spec, um, but again, it, it, it's free to anyone using it. Uh, PaceRepresentatives.com, um, a collaborative website in the Northeast, uh, 600 AutoCAD details uh, where high-performance exterior wall assemblies are documented based on some of the, the Boston BTEC committee work and the, the state. Uh, energy code requiring you know an air and vapor barrier membrane and an assembly and insulation outboard of that so uh, a dynamic site um, our website um, again free downloads on you know got 200 short form specs for products uh, green products uh, spec checklist again for free if it's if it's of use um, that's great if you uh, give it always uh, looking for feedback so um, probably a uh, um, a number of other online resources that are very popular, um, um, forspecs.com for the uh, for the forms is, is well used. Uh, folks like um, uh, McGraw-Hill, uh, Reed um, also have uh, active sites. When we talk about, um, you know, how do we really deliver sustainability, it's because we have standards. Um, we have master format, the 2011 edition now, the 2012 is being vetted in two weeks based on comments 
Um, we find in, in uh, our area 80% of the firms are now using the uh, six-digit numbers. Uniformat also a version out by CSI uh, last year uh, as well as an ASTM version. Um, so now that we have these standards, now that the National CAD standard is out there, uh, version 5, uh, a few thousand users, um, Omniclass, um, the 23 tables that, that structure the universe, um, everything from the phase of the project to the material to the room designations to the official definitions of a room and the space, lots of group using that. And then green format, again, green format, the PDF, um, is quite a valuable tool. Um, we, you know, with the phases that we go through a project, the pre-planning, the preliminary design, design to bidding and procurement, what is it we're doing, cost planning, detailed design, cost estimates, what formats are we using, um, the reason that the architectural, to me, uh, a big reason the architectural profession can, can deliver to the marketplace more sustainable buildings is because we're using um, CSI format, um, we're using uh, industry standard documents, whether it's section page format, section format, page format, master format. Um, so the, the pieces or parts are there and can give you the confidence that the work you'll be doing will carry to other offices and, and won't be lost. Um, you know, BIM, BIM's just creeping out there. I, it's hard to do a presentation these days without it. There's uh, BIM as a design model. Uh, BIM is a production model. Uh, BIM is an asset management model. And as we go through design, bid, build, and operate a, a building. So whatever the, um, there are firms, for example, that will put uh, programming information uh, into their model and then revalidate it at the end of construction documents. There are, there are firms that, that are, are doing that. It's um, very parallel to what we're doing with the sustainability. From our point of view, the specs are becoming less static. Um, we see sustainability properties being put into a model. Um, we see um, firms organizing their, their standard pieces and parts. Um, we have uh, BIM generated specifications. You can build in your sustainability. You can build in your performance. Remember performance. Remember, remember, remember. Performance is a sustainable attribute. So if you're a hotel chain operator and you need that STC 53 door between two units and you tell the architect that you, by the way, you've bought 18,000 of them this year, um, and here are the details and here are the BIM objects, um, well, then, then you're going to comply. There is software that will generate specifications from a model. Uh, in my practice, we have to generate specifications, full specifications about uh, at 50% DD. The drawings aren't done yet, and, and so that, um, that software um, that has that functionality is very valuable. It hasn't caught up to my, my particular practice yet. Um, when uh, Bob Wygant's house, it's kind of nice to be able to dim the lights in the living room. It's nice to look out the uh, uh, window. It's a nice to be able to do your stormwater calculation. But Bob, a Bob actually put in uh, every single stud in the house. He doesn't recommend doing that on a big project. Um, but it saved him a lot of money uh, when his studs were pre-cut. Um, it saved him a lot of waste on site. And then uh, he wasn't doing this for anybody else. He was. He was doing it for himself because uh, then he went and, and built the house. So when it comes to specifications, here's a, here's a typical CSI uh, format spec, part one general, part two products, part three execution. Um, where does sustainability fit in here? So in part two there, perhaps you can see that there's a USG product specified by model number and its grid and Armstrong and its model number and grid and certainty and its model number and grid. And then the performance criteria, it's, it's not too far of a stretch to realize that you can go a lot farther than that when it comes to information in a spec or in a model. Um, so we have these same acoustical mineral fiber ceilings, in this case in a Revit family and the acoustical ceiling type. There are keynotes built in. There are master format numbers you can use. There are uniformat numbers you can use. There are cost codes you can use. There are seven credits that this uh, uh, acoustical mineral fiber um, 
uh, might contribute to. You can see here that the answer is yes or no. So again, you have you have to decide what you're looking for. If if you if you pick that 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 product by its name and number, it, it comes with all these attributes. Um, but if you need to defend those attributes because you're counting on it contributing to a lead credit or some other program, then um, the spec should really say that. What happens with product literature? This is um, uh, USG, uh, let me use this Mars Climate Plus brochure, you can see what lead credits, you can see the picture, you can see it in use, but it, it isn't really quite good enough when um, an architect tells me, hey Mark, just uh, I want to use the Mars Climate Plus ceiling, I, I always hope that they'll turn the second page because there are three edge types, there are seven sizes, and there are seven grids and they don't all go together. And if you're not able to figure this out um, by yourself, then uh, they built this functionality into the USG Design Studio um, product as well. But uh, so you know, just going back a slide or two, here's the acoustical ceilings with some information in part two. Here are those exact same words essentially um, on a piece of product literature, and here they are again in the expanded form. Um, again, word for word, pretty much the same. The manufacturers care desperately about all those, uh, all that data down there, because it separates them from the construction. Um, I wouldn't be foolish enough to think that the architect would would want or would put themselves uh, want to put all this information in the themselves. A lot of times, as we get that, you know, USG USG Mars Climate Plus eight six nine eight five, and we're asked to to find equals. Um, sometimes when you find the three equals, you know, that's enough. Uh, let's be fair to the contractor and tell them it's two by two by three quarter inches and it's white and it's class A and uh, let, the B, let the rest be what it is. But um, again, here it is in the product literature, here it is in the spec, here it is in the BIM model. They're the same words. They're the same words. You just have to decide whether BIM is going to become a valuable enough tool to the people who are looking downstream of our projects, whether whether or not that's that's going to be uh, put in there in the future. And uh, and again, um, that's it's my opinion that it is. We see architects who are being paid to do as built models. We see contractors doing the same thing. So this past weekend we had our our uh, national technical committee meeting. Omniclass and the maintenance of it was a was a hot topic. Sustainability and submittals. Where TechCom is trying to um, um, streamline the submittal process electronically to make it easier to take and and do submittal registers. Uh, property sets uh, are being uh, um, developed uh, at a, quite a remarkable pace by the government. Again, uh, for free on the whole building design guide site. Uh, specifications in COBE. COBE is the Construction Operations Building Information Exchange Program. The government wants to know what's the model number, when does the filter need to be changed, what's the capacity um, of the materials in the building, what's the warranty. There are actually like 10 things you can track when it comes to a warranty. You know, when's it start, when's it end, who holds it, what's it cover. So uh, we're starting to see those, those um, O and M manual requirements in the um, specifications uh, being required to comply with the COBE requirements, which means that the contractor has to fill out a couple of spreadsheets so that it can be loaded into the government system. Um, BIM specs, whatever you call the connection between BIM and specifications, green specs. Um, you know that's that we have to build it into the specifications. I, I think all of us know that you don't have to say lead in a project specification and a project manual. They have the project lead certified. You specify what you want. You take the submittals, and and you go for it. Um, CSI in, in green format. This is a repeat of a, a slide uh, from the beginning of the of the the session. You know, take a look at green format. Uh, uh, are on the CSI CSINet.org for the for the um, you know track down the link so you get the the free PDF. Um, I personally wish the green format maintenance task team um, a lot of success. If you have a direction that they'd like to go in, please stay involved with CSI and you know you can get in on some of the calls. Um, Paul Bertram with his uh, focus on sustainability and a uh, 
previous um, position. He was the sustainability director for the North American Insulation Manufacturers Association. So Paul has a long time uh, commitment to sustainability and, and CSI is um, following that lead. Our practice group, please um, give us your feedback. Previous sessions are, are there next month in August. Richard Moore is doing a walk through through LEED 2012 and the, the credits that are going to change. Uh, not sure if that's going to come out in 2012 or, or 2013. So um, just, just in closing, um, this, this certainly may be risky business. Um, we really can do just about anything we want to when we put our minds to it. I mean, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Um, CSI is not delivering this from on high. It's, it's, it's the membership in the industry that's, that's the uh, ground swell from, you know, from, the, uh, from the wider number to the, to the fewer num numbers. And the reason we're doing this is because we only have this one environment. We have, uh, we have to uh, learn to, to live with each other and make the use of the most of the re make the most of the resources we have. So, 